Welcome to the newest episode of On The Odd. If you have a story you would like to share, and you would like to come on to the show to share it, please email me at mark, M-E-R-K, at ontheodd.com. From the paranormal, to the extraordinary, from the weird, to the wonderful, this is On The Odd. Tonight we have a very special guest. His name is Kevin Courtois. He has studied all forms of holistic healing and has a deep understanding of spiritual energies. He offers clients help with all forms of healing and has at his disposal an enormous array of spiritual tools from several kinds of tachyon wands to hundreds of homeopathic elixirs that can be amplified by any number of technologies. It has been Kevin's experience that DNA is essentially reprogrammable. The problem has been the lack of power. Please welcome to the show, Kevin Coutois. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, Kevin. Oh, you're welcome. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, same here, man. It's always nice to speak to somebody who grew up on Long Island, and um, but you su- uh, successfully escaped. <laughs> oh, yes, I escaped to Manhattan. That's true. <laughs> you got the one-way Long Island Railroad <laughs> ticket. From New York, CF2 New York. Yeah, awesome. (laughs) But, um, you you know, it's funny. We were talking just for a few minutes before, and I was saying, you know, you cover so many different topics when it comes to all of this. And I didn't want to just, like, stick to what I wanted to talk about because, you, like I said, you cover so much. So I really wanted to talk about what you're currently working on, but you're working on a million things. So I chose Orgone, Orgon. And um, as as something that kind of popped up when I was doing a little bit of research on you. And orgone energy is one of those things that I hear about, people speak about, but I don't have a precise understanding of what it physically is. And I was hoping that maybe you can cover that a little. Okay, orgone energy. Orgone was discovered by Dr. Wilhelm Reich, who was a psychoanalyst at the Vienna Institute under Sigmund Freud. Uh, he worked with Adler and Rogers and um, uh, the, the other one, um, Carl Jung. And right. they, they all worked at this institute for a while, and then they branched off and, and went into their own modalities. And, and Wilhelm Reich <clears throat> believed that healing was uh, psychosomatic. So, so in order for healing to take place, it had to, be, uh, had to deal with the body. Right? There had to be an emotional release relative to the body. It wasn't just a mental operation that you tried to figure it out with your mind. So he kind of branched off from the other, you know, psychoanalysts into a, a more body field oriented thing. And he would, of course, experiment with other ideas and things. And so one day he discovered he dropped the metal spoon into some bucket of uh, some organic matter. I forgot what it was. And he noticed after a while that there was this blue light emanating from the from the bucket, and uh, he eventually coined that energy orgone, which is a, a combination of orgasm and ozone. So he took the two and, and locked them together, and that's essentially. I never knew that or the org had to do with orgasm. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, I know it's funny. Um, he always thought he, his basic theory was, and you know, I think what started with this is that. All psychosomatic illnesses are a function of se- sexual repression or distortion. Hmm. So the body would lock up. It, 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 he calls it body armoring, and the body would suppress feelings and things, and that would 
you know, generate some form of, you know, mental and emotional illness eventually. Hmm. You know, people take masks and identity in order to operate the world. Not, you know, we kind of, as we get older, we learn that we can't say what we, we can't speak what's on our mind or, you know, we can't do what we want. So to learn how to operate in the world and operate in society. And, um, you know, people begin to, you know, all, all, there's all this control dynamics, you know. Mm -hmm. And so his work was about, you know, restoring proper functioning of the, of the orgasm mechanism, but also, you know, how people operate in the world. So he, he thought it, he said it was rooted in, in, the, in the sex. <clears throat> so anyway, that's, that's a little sad topic. But so he discovered this life force energy, right? And then he started experimenting with it. So he made this thing called this orgone box and he would put some of his patients in there and it would, you know, there's energy in the box. And so it would relieve a lot of the uh, neurotic disorders that uh, these people have. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily cure them per se, but he noticed a, a radical drop in, in the symptoms of his patients. Wow. And he applied the, this, the stuff to Alan and he was able to create some models and so he could shoot the uh, phone up into the atmosphere and he could make it rain or he could clear the skies. He's basically modifying the weather, balancing the, you know, the heaven and the earth, the chi. So he's, he's restoring some sort of, you know, equilibrium to the universe, into your energetic space or in the environment you live in. Hmm. So... I discovered this right after 9-11. I was on some forum, you know, for orgone and stuff. And, you know, people are, you know, making orgone and, you know, talking about stuff. And and so I started making orgone at home and, and uh, started playing with it. So, like, say you make a basic orgone piece, right? And you stick it in the house and it starts generating energy. So what we call the good and bad feelings in life, you know, like our base state of how we, we're doing. You can change that environment, right? You can add energy into an environment. And so you start having more energy, subtle energy, and then you start doing more positive things over a period of time, simply because there's more energy in the environment. So like the whole aging process itself is basically a loss of energy as we get older. Mm -hmm. So we start, we're like, charge batteries when we're born and it, there's a it, almost the what we call the kundalini is sort of like a battery winding down and, and begin to drop an energy down and that drops you know happiness emotion level because being happy is a high energy state. feeling good is actually a high energy state and so typically as people you know, get older especially after they like crisis you know, they start, they start very pessimistic in life, not, you know, not as optimistic. Their, their world begins to close off. Close. So they, they retract inside, stay at home more. They don't go out. As, the kids are, you rule the night. Young, young people rule the night. You never see old people. On. No. After six o'clock, they disappear or whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Right. And that's because that there's nothing for them at the night anymore, because the night is like mystery. It's fun, you know, but, you know, as you get older, the, you know, life becomes more routine mm -hmm. and, you know, you're not, you know, you're not as young, young and as good looking. So the choices <laughs> regarding how you express, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, everyone knows It's brutal that. and they, honest though, you know, <laughs> they don't want to talk about it. Right. But that's really the case. And so as you lose your, your sexual vitality or, or charisma, your world begins to close off, right? And then if you, as an adult, if you've become accomplished, you've built character in yourself and all these other things, these things can begin to compensate for the loss of youth, uh, loss, loss, loss of youth. Hmm. You know, like a man, what he, he becomes a power, right? Man accumulates power and then there's a whole nother aspect of what being a man is that opens up, you know, after a certain age. Huh, that's interesting way of um, 
It's totally true. I mean, you know, it's like right. different roles change as we get older. Um, and you right, know, and you lose, you lose interest. You lose interest in some things that that you had as a kid simply because to me they're boring. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I've been there, done that. I'm not really that interested anymore. And I'm I'm more interested in things uh, searching for the truth. You know, mm-hmm. I love discovering things about you know life, the mysteries in life, right? Sure. So, like, I was a kid in high school or, or even younger. I would never do what the teachers told me. So they give me assignments and things, and I would wander off in the library and just start studying other stuff. <laughs> and, you know, when it came time to finish the assignment, I would whip it up in like an hour and, and throw it in. And I didn't really care if I got an A or not. Hmm. It was like, oh, got a B. That's great. You know, from, from my point of view, what they wanted me to learn in school was like, well, I'll get this done, but I want to get it done the easiest, quickest way to get it done. Right. It's like you get it. You know, you, yeah. you understand the basic, the principles and the foundation that they're trying to teach. You don't need mm-hmm. to be overly drilled into your head. It's like, I get it. You know, it's like, I get it. It's red. You know, it's no matter, you know, I don't now need to take 30 tests to make sure I know it's red. Um, and, and, you know, I right. think maybe that's a problem that... Um, that happened. I mean, I'm 45, and I, I definitely grew up in a school kind of like that, where it's like they just drill it into your head, and it's like, all right, I get it already. It's like enough. <laughs> and I would just go on right. my own in a lot and, of ways. It's what you're saying, you know. And, and actually, smart smarter kids learn by themselves, right? Mm-hmm. They they know how to learn, right? So when you stick them in environments where you're forcing them. To learn in a certain way, it doesn't really work for me. Right. So I would wander off the reservation and do what I wanted to do, you know. And hence, my grades were not perfect in school, but I, I it's almost like I had another education system on the side besides going to school because there were other things I was really interested in. And I did it just to do it, you know, because I liked reading about this stuff and learning about this stuff. But it wasn't like there was a course for it. I get a grade for it. Hmm. Now, another thing that you talk about, uh, a bit about is uh, synchronicity. And I think a lot yeah. of what you're talking about actually is synchronicity. When yeah. you're in a library, I, I don't think that there's anything more magical than walking around and finding the exact book that you've never heard of. That's completely interesting to you at that moment. You know, it right. might be, it might be uh, a book about, it could be anything. It could be a cookbook mm-hmm. on how to hunt and, you know, fend for yourself and deal with an animal from point A to point B. Um, but it's like really just kind of intuitively finding something. And I think that that has a lot to do with synchronicity. And I think maybe when we are kids and we're in these libraries and we're being forced to go, all right, you know, you're going to go read about Laura Ingalls Wilder or whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah. and that's your job. Like your job is to read that book and write a three page report and that's it. But the, all you want to do is go and read about, like, Houdini, you know? It's, and, right. Um, and that was me. You know, it's like, I, I got to find magic books, you know, about, you know, the history of silent film or something like that. And, but I think that those things are so important to me as a person. Um, and I, I think by putting a kid in a library, it really is kind of, I think it's allowing them to ad- tap into that synchronicity. Um, I loved, like, letting my kid just kind of wander and, like, find a bunch of books that I'm like, these are just great, like, like ape shit crazy, like the topics that you're choosing. And it's like, all right, we'll take them all out, you know, see if you like them. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't want to discourage his uh, interests. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I do. But, you know, synchronicity, of course, doesn't just stop there. Um, one thing, there's a video um, of an interview that you did that was flo- that is floating around. And you're talking about the number 20 reappearing throughout a number of different um, uses. And it it gets to the point where it's no longer a coincidence, really. Um, right. And I, I think a lot to do with, um, like, when we when people look at a clock and it's 11-11, you know. I think these are things that, I don't know what they mean exactly, but I think that they mean that we're in tune with something. <laughs> I don't have the. Well, I don't have any answers, but and, and that that entombment thing is really like 
what does that mean? You're, you're following your life path, we'll call it that way. It's sort of like a map that we follow, and synchronicity is sort of like we know we're on the right road. Right, like a train doesn't know it's on tracks. Yeah. You know? And so, like, when I, when I tried to live my life based on a routine and operating from my mind, uh, it never worked, right? Mm-hmm. It, it created a lot of pain, emotional pain, psychological pain, because I wasn't listening to their internal map, right? Mm-hmm. I wasn't listening to the heart. They call it live, follow the heart, right? And that's really true. And so I think most of my life has been really about learning to all full time. Like that's the way I live, and it, it's 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 completely goes against the way we're taught, you know. So then you're you're really going based on how you feel, and not not that you don't have routine and job and work, but you create a lot of uh, open space to let stuff happen, right? mm. and not get caught up in in the, like a lot of relationships were removed out of my life, so it could open up space in my life. To kind of let that synchronicity flow, and it, and a lot of the synchronicity is is insights, internal insights. So I really look at life as being two different states. You either live real life and moving towards reality, the real, or you live in the fake world. Right? The now, one of the things that I find interesting is, um, well, are you affiliated with OrgonProducts.org? I just um, that's my website. Okay, yeah. I wanted to make. I, I just wasn't one hundred percent sure. Um, so, one of the things that fascinates me um, on, in the products that you have are these organ healing discs that mm-hmm. are um, they're epoxy resin and they are they're, they're really kind of amazing looking. But will the is the goal of these to kind of tap into this to tap into this. Um, this path that we're talking about, you know, because I, I personally think anybody can choose a path to say, you know what, I'm going to graduate high school. I'm going to go to this college. I'm going to graduate, going to get married. I'm going to, you know, have my, have a kid retire and done. Right. Yeah. But that may not be a real path. You know, what we're talking about is more of a, well, you know what, maybe I'll drop out of college in the middle and I'm going to try to write a book. You know, that type of thing. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to jump on the plane. I'm going to go to Thailand or something. It's, um, to, you know, the, the self-exploration. And I'm not saying these discs will guarantee that, of course. But is the goal of these discs um, in your life to help you kind of achieve this awareness of this other path? And is it even good to be aware of this path? I'm asking 30 uh, questions. Yeah, I'm good. sorry. Well, it does. You know, it's funny thing is that you mentioned that because, uh, you know, I have a friend of mine and we're both kind of doing the same thing. And it, we both, you know, especially living in New York City, it's it's very difficult to get synchronicity in New York City mm-hmm. because you're not really living in the real world here. It, it's it's a it's a control mechanism. You know, when what you part of in- town do you live in, if you don't mind me asking? I live on 20th Street. Oh, that's right. You said that. All right. <laughs> it's a great part of town, though. All right. <laughs> it's on First Avenue, 20th Street. I'm over in Peter Cooper Village. Okay. Uh, which is part of Stuyvesant Town. I think everyone's heard of Stuyvesant Town. Um, and, you know, I've been here for a while. And it's, you know, it's it's one of those complexes. It's like a Disney World. <laughs> Everything is, you know, it's a corporate corporate environment and you know not much goes on here right right you know i mean everyone's nice and neighbors you know don't make noise and- but finding synchronicity in the middle of manhattan like you're saying is not exactly it's not an easy task no it, it's not it, when you when you become I'll, I'll put it this way when you become a threat to the matrix in other words what i mean by that is you can begin to break up their program so the matrix likes this very controlled environment where everything doesn't really happen. It's, it's very boring, dull, and there's no vitality to life, right? No one's really happy. They just walk around like zombies. Mm-hmm. It's, you look at today that most people, will, you know, they're stuck in their cell phone and you barely get eye contact or anything. And rarely do you ever enter the stranger anymore. You know, everything is on the sub world of the Internet. 
yeah. social media or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's again, you're 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 putting people in a, in an alternate universe is not the real world. So when you walk out in the public, you're not really interacting with anyone because they're all caught in this world that's on the internet. You know. Right, they're they're stuck in this like virtual, um, yeah, collection of moments. I mean, that's all it really yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> so, like those interesting moments in life, the ones you're going to look back on your deathbed, so to speak. <laughs> I hope stuff. not. I hope uh, I'm not on my deathbed with my iPhone. <laughs> yeah, you're thinking like, well, you know that one time. <laughs> um, it's like, oh my god, that I I never thought of this, but that would be my biggest fear. It's to like I'm on my deathbed and I get a little thing from Facebook saying something along the lines of. Here's a picture of you from 15 years ago. You know, <laughs> my biggest fear. Or like, or like happy birthday. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like, oh, that guy died three years ago. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we, we live in a world that um, is a little bit, uh, well, more than just a little bit artificial. Um, and even if we took away the iPhones and the um, the right. make-believe happiness um, online, <laughs> we would still, like so, you, you were saying, you live in Disneyland. When you... Yeah. <laughs> You, you cultivate an awareness, though, and you're around people that are not they're not awake. It, it becomes very painful to be in the presence because you're not getting any interactions. And you realize that that life is about uh, energy exchange all the time. And so then a, a healthy environment is you're having energy exchanges with people all over the place that that are authentic and real. They're not, you know, they're not fraudulent. Mm-hmm. In, in the interactions and and then you feel good as a result of that right you feel vitalized and things so when you are becoming real and you're around fake people there's emotional pain and psychic pain that you have to deal with right yeah and that's usually something reason why people close their hearts off is because they can't deal with that emotional and psychic pain do you limit yourself with online presence or um the the general use i i do now yeah I found um, initially it was a new toy, like everyone. And after a while, it didn't it didn't really accomplish much. <laughs> you know, I it's part of my work to be up on yeah. all of this. And um, I have to admit, like I I hate the internet more and more. And I was there for like I was the eight year old nerd on bulletin board systems on my like modem at home. Yeah. And um, saying I'm going to recreate war games, and it's. Um, it just wasn't, it's not what I wanted it to be, <laughs> you know, I wanted right. it to be something totally different. And what it, what it's become is, I don't know what it's become. A shit storm, I guess. Um, you know, it's addictions so, too. Right. Right. It's addictions. Yeah. And, and it creates a, it creates, you know, people can be anything behind a computer screen. And what yeah. you're doing, I have to admit it. When I start reading things like, you know, um, like the Oregon energies and uh, we start discussing synchronicity or um, we're going to bring up things like weather manipulation and things like this. This is the stuff that, you know, um, that I find more interesting than what somebody who I graduated high school from with, you know, is having to for dessert or something. Um, I think we have to really make a decision sometimes uh, whether or not we want to be boring in the virtual world as well as in our real world. Because it's really interesting what you were saying, how as we do get older, we become definitely more reserved. We become closed off to the things that we used to, you know, kind of get off on when we were a kid. When we were a kid, we'd ride a bicycle around all day and we'd think, I'm never going to not own a bicycle, you know. Yeah, and most adults don't own a bicycle, <laughs> so um, you won't. You know, most people won't even go three blocks without driving there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it's just crazy, and it, it's really wild when I start thinking like you know, people's virtual existences are just as dull as their <laughs> real existences, and it's not really not supposed to be like that at all. No, no, <laughs> it's wild. I and never that, thought that. Been- you know, that's been changing for a while, for generations. Yeah. And it's got to a point, like, it can't, it can't get any worse without a, something breaking down. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think we're at that. I, I call it a breakthrough point. I, I don't see that. 
the things that I believe are going to collapse in, in the world um, need to collapse, right? And, and people are going to go through an emotional catharsis because we're not going to war. So we're going to have emotional breakdowns instead without the war. So we're actually breaking the cycle of war. So the whole war and peace thing is a cycle, right? And yeah, I mean, there's a number of things, you know. Karma, debt builds up, you have financial debt, you have emotional debt builds up, and then the war breaks out, right, to settle the debt. It's a blood debt, right? This is how society has operated for thousands of, of years. Of course, and it's all cylindrical. So yeah. we're, we're coming to it. And, I, you know, I hate to sound like the guy who's like, the Internet's a fad. But, you know, it might be kind of on its way out in a lot of ways. I tell, I have a number of clients, I used to design iPhone apps for everybody. Not for everybody, but a number of iPhone apps. And I've talked my clients out of them because I'm like, not only do they cost you money every year to give away these free apps, but nobody uses them anymore. How, like, right. You pick up somebody's iPhone, they have 350 apps. They don't use any of them. I'm like, go back to getting a website. It's cheaper. You can do whatever you want. And you, know, you can just literally do whatever you want at a fraction of the cost. I'm like, I think that we're going, we have to go a little bit backwards. I think we went a little too forward. And, um, we either need to like backpedal some of this or, um, or something. I I'm, I'm bored with the internet. I think most people are. Yes. Uh, even, totally. even Netflix, you go on Netflix, you watch the same three things, you know, it's, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I hate to sound like such a negative jerk right now, but the reality of all of this is, that, you know, well, I, I don't remember the last time that I, um, I turned on any of these services and thought, wow, this stuff, I, I'm so happy to be living in this um, futuristic world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm telling a machine to turn my lights on and off. I can get up and just flip the switch. And and devoid of connection with a, with a real human being. Yeah. And to me, that's, I, I <laughs> the whole, my whole work is about becoming more intimate with living. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And, and what happens with intimacy is people, people who are, you know, have a lot of emotional baggage, let's call it that. As soon as they start to feel intimacy, it makes them very uncomfortable. Right? A lot of people tend to over-sexualize intimacy, right? It, it you know, they, they associate intimacy with sex and then they destroy the intimacy to go right to sex or, or they pull back and they, you know, they, all sorts of weird things can happen. Um, but really, it's meant to be a state of living. Like, this is how we're supposed to live with everyone. You know, we're supposed to be intimate with life all the time. Mm-hmm. You know. um, I, I'm still, I, I, I'm fascinated by these products that you sell. And um, I just have a few questions. Are What are they physically? Like, what, um, if you were to get a disc or you also have cones, um, mm-hmm. and there's another, I forget the word for it. There was another product in here that's really, you have a number of really interesting products, including like colloidal silver, which is one of one of these really controversial products, but at the same time has been very, very proven to be an excellent um, healer. And um, for whatever reason, you know, medical world does not want to embrace it. Um, well, they, that was intentional going back to the 1930s when they turned the homeopathic colleges into allopathic medicine. Hmm. The Rockefellers did this, and they took over the boards of colleges. They funded it, and they they start putting their own people on, and they changed the curriculum over a period of time. So, they um, got, got the, rid of all the stuff sorry. that was happening before, you know, like the 1930s. So, with the organ, um, organ, uh, organ, um, the, there's cones and pyramids. Um, you hear the plane going over here? You miss Long Island? Oh. Um, <laughs> I just had a ambulance. <laughs> I, I'm right near JFK, so it's kind of like, ooh, yeah. that's like a 757 going over my head right now, and I'm in the um, upstairs of my house. So, um, so inside of these, it's a translucent resin that they're cast in. It seems, and um, yeah. what's yeah. inside? What there, there seems to be um, different well, types of metal and bead, uh, like ball bearings or some sort um, of. Or the base of orgone is steel. So Wilhelm Reich would use steel. Mm-hmm. And then I'll use brass, copper. Um, 
Sometimes it'll, I'll use silver even if mm -hmm. I have it. Not, you know, like silver powder. I'll put a, a, some sprinkles in it. Um, and then there's some crystals in there, and then it's it's kind of mixed together. It's all mixed together. And they're you know, really it, cool looking. I mean, if I yeah. if I just put one of these like on a table or something, it's like it looks a lot cooler than just putting like a vase. And it's like a, it's like a living thing, you know. And it generates energy, and so a lot of why people like it is because the energy that's coming off of it. You know, like dead things mm. we tend not to pick up. You know things that are alive and they generate energy, which can give us an experience, like energy leads to an experience. And are these hand cast? Like, what's the whole process? This well, I have molds, but I mean, I make them here, you know. But I'm saying you pour them, or? I pour them, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's... So there's no, like, um, there's no, like, I guess, um, like, there's a formula, but it's not really, it's a handmade formula. It's kind of like, well, there's no, no, well, it's, it's no two will be the same. Yeah. Right. There's no, as far as the exact proportion of metals, no, that changes. It's sort of like when you're cooking, yeah. you know, you're throwing ingredients together and you know how much you need to put in. A pinch. And you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, really measuring is like, you haven't mastered what you're doing. If mm -hmm. you have to, you know, and, you know, it, it, and it, over time, I've learned how to alter things. Sometimes I put too much metal in, and it overheats, and it doesn't cure correctly and things. And over time, I learned to, you know, hmm. be exact with the proportion. So It's amazing. I mean, I, I really think that um, it's definitely interesting products that, you, you know, you offer. And, again, this is all at OregonProducts.org. I'll put a link to it in the show notes regardless. So, so let's take – Let's take the outdoor chem buster. I call it the chem buster for chemtrails. Okay. And if people are not familiar with chemtrails, it's aerial spraying with aluminum and, and other chemicals that they interact supposedly with the heart project mm -hmm. for weather modification or manipulation, we'll call it that. I'm looking for that product. Where is that? It's on what, the left side. What was the exact type, uh, name of it? Chem, chem buster. Chem buster. Oh, I see. I, well, I see mini chem buster. And the bigger one. The bigger one had the better description. So. Okay. <laughs> so the cat. So the interesting. I. So I've been work, doing this about fifteen, sixteen years, and um, so I got some interesting reports with the with the chem busters over the year. And so, like last year, with Hurricane, uh, I forget which one, the one in Florida. Um. I sold the chem Irene, buster. Yeah. I sold the chem buster to a woman in Florida right before the hurricane. She put it in her yard. The hurricane came, and all of her property was untouched. Sure. Wow. Including the whole town was kind of like protected, and then the towns on either side were just you know devastated. But not even she said not even a leaf or a branch was broken in her yard. Hmm. You know. And I've had other people report that, but that was the most dramatic, uh, you know, testimony or report that I got from a, a client. And, you know, so what this thing can alter the weather patterns. But what is really weather? Weather is actually controlled by us. Like our mental and emotional states basically control the weather. And. The reason why they focus on weather manipulation so much, there's, you know, with the, the news media people, they always talking about the weather. And whenever a storm's coming by, they're like, they want to make it really worse than it is, you know. Well, of and course. that's really a predictive programming model. So up until recently, they could predict the weather because they were controlling the weather, mm -hmm. you know. So the way they say the weather's going to be this and this and this, and people would be like, oh, that's what the weather's going to be, and that's what the weather becomes. But then since consciousness is changing and people are becoming awake, that, that control is, is falling apart. So the whole global warming thing is the losing control of the mind control mechanism. And one of the mind control mechanisms is how they manipulate the weather. So if they're artificially inducing a weather pattern, they're going against what the people are trying to generate themselves. So our emotional states express themselves as the weather, right? 
so, I never thought of it like that. But yeah. yeah. So if our emotional states are opening up and changing, and we're going to make the weather very good and positive, and they said, no, 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 we want to screw them up again. So they start, you know, sending counter frequencies and they want to make rain or maybe they, you know, who knows what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Make it windy or hot or humid. What they're looking to do is to shut the consciousness expansion down. So they're at, they're throwing in a counter wave to kind of screw people up. And it affects our minds, right? Our auras extend up into the clouds, right? So as we become spiritually evolved and we get stronger, our auras will open up and get larger, right? And so as the heart opens up, we can basically generate more energy, right? So yeah. we basically become the ones that are the caretakers of the world. The Bible talks about that, you know, when we're in the garden and we're the gardeners, basically. You know, um, I, one thing is like right before Hurricane Sandy, I forget the name of the hurricane that was right before that, maybe a year or so before. Um, that's when people were really starting to look at weather patterns. Um, yeah. And I'm sure it's been going on much longer, but this is like the first time at least it got my attention where they were, sh where it seemed as though there were these direct strange um, anomalies in, in the cloud forms. And it seems as though this anomaly came out of nowhere and then turned into this kind of crazy storm. And um, I think it was Hurricane Sandy that started like that. And, you know, when you start seeing these and, and the outcome, it really does make you kind of start questioning things. Um, also, with Hurricane Sandy, um, you know, I was buying a house during Hurricane Sandy, almost literally. And I was moving um, to the house I'm in right now. And we were selling a house in Seaford Harbor, which, and there, it's about 12 miles apart. Seaford Harbor and, and like the Massapequa area, you, you probably know about these areas, were obliterated. They, you know, so many houses were just wrecked, gone, you know? Over here in Hewlett, nothing. It, it was like, oh, you know what? Um, oh, that's a shame that branch broke, you know? Yeah. And, you know, for a hurricane to come through, like, I remember Hurricane Gloria when I was a kid. That affected everywhere. These new storms, these current storms, I'll, I'll call them current instead of new storms, are pinpointing. You know, it seems they they have specific spots that that are like these little epicenters where they're doing their most damage, but around them they're not doing nearly as much damage. And is that a new phenomenon that, you, that you've seen? Well, I think I think... Like, for instance, last week, they, what did they have, Hurricane Florence? I think it was. Um, I, I don't I, oh, yeah, that's right. Like, down south, I think. That was in the Carolinas. Yeah. You know? And and who knows how bad it really was. I mean, it rained and, you know, flooded. <laughs> it's, it's funny because I'm on Long Island. I don't pay attention to any storm that's not here. <laughs> right. Exactly. Why would we? <laughs> yeah, right. Come on. <laughs> I mean, you know. You I pay enough taxes. I don't need to worry about your storm. <laughs> right there, you know. If you watch the earthquake map, you know, you go to, like, the U.S. government earthquake map. Oh, and like, there are earthquakes going on all over the uh, the world every day. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's nuts, actually. On four point, you know, they're all over the place. So you could get obsessed with anything, I guess, and, mm -hmm. and pay attention to it. Or you, you know, you're only going to pay attention to the weather in your area. So, for instance, Florence, you know, came here and then nothing happened in New York. There were four other hurricanes that were brewing behind Florence. What happened to those oh, guys? Oh, yeah, I remember that. They were like, <laughs> we're, we're keeping an eye on this guy, you know. <laughs> well, they're not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, you know, that's an excellent point. Holy cow, I'm making a note of this. I, I need to find out what happened to those hurricanes. You know what? I won't find anything. I'll bet you the last mention I'll find is the when what we're talking about, when they last brought it up. Yeah. Because they were yeah. like, these look like super storms or something. Right. And they're, and they're trying to use their predictive programming to generate and make it happen. What's happening now is some people have gotten so conscious, they're saying, no, we're not going to have that here. And it really, it comes down to that. So, like, you've noticed over the last, even Sandy, there was, it didn't rain in Manhattan with Sandy. No, not at all. 
there was flooding that came over the water, but there was no rain actually where I was living. But in all fairness, you're on the water. You know, it's like it's yeah. the island of Manhattan. You know? Right. <laughs> right, but it didn't rain, and, and there hasn't really been a hurricane. Every hurricane that's come towards New York has kind of bounced, made a right turn out back out in the ocean. Yeah. Or it went up into Boston and hit the, you know, Red Sox. You know, I, I, I like this philosophy. It's more than a philosophy because it, it, it's almost like you can really attach um, actual. It would be a hard thing to prove on paper, of course, but it, it seems as though that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, people will start freaking out, too. They get really scared nowadays. It's like we're like PTSD with storms. Well, um, yes. And, you know, the work I know with the, the, the Oregon and, and other technology I have, I have a magnetic resonance field technology. And all this stuff, what it, what it ends up doing is it amplifies your mind, right? So your mind becomes really strong. And then, at least for me, it seems like I can affect the matrix itself. And so, like, I don't want it to rain today and it doesn't rain, you know? So does Oregon work? Oh, I'm sorry. Is Oregon what? No, I, I cut you off. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I, I'm basically, I just want to ask, is Oregon something that's just always active? Like, it's almost like, um, like, I don't care if you believe me or not. It's the truth, that type of thing. Like, it's like, even if you don't believe that Oregon, like these cones are um, emitting energy or, or changing patterns, are they anyway? Or is, does, well, or, I mean, or is it a philosophy yeah. that you have to really kind well, of... Well, if it's a tangible energy, it's real. Mm -hmm. And if someone doesn't believe it, doesn't mean it's not real. Right. Like, some people believe in spirits and others don't. But that doesn't have any bearing on whether spirits are real. Either they are or they're not, <laughs> you know. But, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll talk about something that is... Um, that really does need a faith-based background. But what we're talking about is genuine energy which is energy energy is energy it's and, there or and, it's not and some people will see the effects of the energy and others will not yeah. you know i mean mm -hmm. they're not open to that frequency range or just an awareness in general you yeah. know well awareness is frequency so mm -hmm. if someone has more awareness they have they're they're reading different parts of the frequency band right so the subtle energy levels uh, like i see that stuff going out all over the place and people like think I'm crazy if I were to tell them what I'm feeling and seeing in the world at large, and they they like it. they have no clue that that those events are connected to energy patterns, right? Mm. So you look at archetypal symbols, and I'll see you know see things that happen in the world and they have significance, right? And you see how consciousness is moving in a direction based on reading your archetypal signs. Yeah. Mm. Um, now, we discussed a little bit about weather manipulation, and one of the things that kind of came and went was the HARP project, and yeah. I brought that up, and, you know, it's claimed that the HARP project is no longer, you know, the structures are still there, it's tremendous antennas. Um, I was just wondering your opinion on all of that. Well, again, we're t talking about frequency, like radio frequency and things like that, so... With HARP, they're transmitting signals. So, I mean, we're transmitting signals all over the place. And whether or not HARP is active, see, what I think is HARP is probably still active in some form. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not having the effect it used to have. So, in other words, th these technologies are being outstripped by human consciousness. We're actually not only, we're, we're basically taking control of technology on a consciousness level. So things that were there to create an outcome that wasn't beneficial to us is now being flipped in a direction like it's actually aiding us. So if you gain energy dominance over a system, you are able to use the energy from that system. You know, so I'm not really afraid of like 5G. You know, that's the next yeah. thing. Because it, to me, it's just more energy. It's like, oh, so I can use that to create more magic, basically. And I, I define magic as a quantum anomaly, right? Something that normally wouldn't be there. And you're shifting reality in a different direction, right? It's interesting because what you're talking about is a very positive thing. You're actually saying that 
um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're actually giving hope to mankind that we're actually evolving enough or we have evolved enough to manipulate these this thing that we feel as though is completely out of control, I think. I think in general, if you ask somebody, can the Internet be stopped, I think the majority of people would say, no, can't be. It's its, its own living entity in a lot of ways. Um, but the way you're describing it is that we are actually continuing to evolve while the Internet is kind of, and, you know, we can take it back in a lot of ways. And we're, we're, what we're going, we're evolving in, in stages, right? So you, you hit a crisis point. And so then there's events. And so the events we're experiencing now are emotional and psychological events. So like in the Bible, they talk about the tribulations, the tribulations. And, and I see like the tribulations we're encountering now is emotional and psychological. And so that's a restoration phenomenon. So I actually think humanity is being restored back to its original form. Hmm. So I see the whole arc is going back to the point of origin and fixing the problem and making a different choice. So we're as as a species, we're 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 like we're like operating systems that are going through life having all these experiences, and we're adding it to our own personal genetic data pool with our ancestors. But we're also adding it to the whole data pool for all of mankind because mm-hmm. we are, you know, there is a group consciousness at work. Um, and so we've accumulated all that is negative information. Right. But we're OK. So how do we overcome the negative information? So we're learning ways to overcome the resistances that are thrown into our life. And in other words, we're becoming very mentally and emotionally s- strong. Sort of like the X Men is really probably a better a better analogy that there are a few people that are becoming like X Men, mm-hmm. and those are the ones that are kind of leading the path of pushing mankind in the right direction. And the ones that are kind of controlling the world, things are failing, but they can't figure out why. Right? They don't know why. They're scratching their head. Well, what this was working a couple of years ago, but it's not working anymore. And now it's not working at all. So they throw the hurricanes this year, and maybe one got through a little bit. But the other four just, they're gone. It's a crap storm. I and mean, we didn't have anything crazy, um, not here anyway. Um, other countries, unfortunately, you know, here and there, gotten was, some serious storms. But the weather in New York City has gotten pretty good, actually, over compared to like 10, 20 years ago. You know, you know, um, I, uh, you know uh, I was talking to somebody um an author, and she she's um, practices a lot of herbals, herbalists, and you know she grows her own stuff. And she was talking about how the, the how weather has really changed over the past twenty years, and um, how it's so different now and everything. And it's in my opinion, it's just not. I've kept a journal for forty years <laughs> since I was yeah. five. And I all, I would always write the weather and all this kind of stuff. If I go back um, to when I start, you know, recording the temperatures, which is probably more like when I was like 11-ish or something, we're really geeking out right there. Um, yeah. It's the same. Or for the most part, it's the same. Um, our winters were a little bit harsher when I was younger. That's, yeah. I could say that. We had more blizzards and stuff. Um but, you know, it's it's really not that – it's hard to also determine. I wrote, it snowed today a lot. You know, that doesn't really – I can't really go back to 1983 and really get a grasp as to what the hell I'm talking about. Um, you know, it could have been the first snow of the season for all I know. Um, but I just don't think it's really changed that much. And, um, you know, like I said, when I was a kid, we had Hurricane Gloria – which is pretty much the equivalent of Hurricane Sandy. We, um, I, I was talking to somebody about Long Island in general, and they were saying that the best thing that they like about this particular area, Manhattan is a part of this, is that we experience every season fully. You know, There's nowhere else really in the world where you get every season, right? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. you know, we get our harsh winter, we get the hot summer, the, you know, we get autumn and spring. And 
really just nowhere else can you really experience that as prevalent as kind of like right here in the armpit of the country. And we, for whatever reason, we're telling each other, not we, you and me, but in general, people are telling each other, oh, winters are so much harsher, no more winters, people are never going to see snow again. And I'm just not buying it, personally. I just don't see it. No, it, and from my point of view, since consciousness is regulating the weather, the weather's going to get more moderate, right? It's going to move towards more moderation. Mm-hmm. Now, some places around the world, the weather's out of control. Well, I look at it, well, look at the people there. You know, they're out of control and the weather's out of control. So then you come in other places where the weather's very balanced. It's relative to the people in that area. Like, where was it where they had, like, the 128 degrees or something? It was, like, ridiculously hot. Um, where? Somewhere on Earth. Um, I'm looking for it. Iraq? <laughs> yeah, it was something like that. It was, like, um, it was not in this country. Um, what's it saying? It's Death Valley, but I don't think Death Valley is the hottest place on Earth. Um, oh, God, I'm going to independent.co.uk. Um, I don't know how honest this will be but anyway i think it's in libya where it's um it's not here but (laughs) it's um i remember it was like last summer not this past summer but the one before it where they were saying that it's so hot there that um you you always hear about this in other countries you know it's so hot you can you know it's breaking records and it's really not breaking records when you really look into it Right, and the, and you hear it on the media, and today, for whatever reason, now, every time you hear about any sort of storm, it's it's like Armageddon, mm-hmm. and it's just like bizarre, like, and and almost I I see they're kind of faking the weather, you know what I mean? Like they'll say, oh, it's really bad here, and it's really not that bad. Well, you saw that clip of the guy like kind of yeah. faking it in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> These yeah. guys just walking with a six pack in the background. Like, <laughs> or, or, or they can easily take old weather footage and just put it on the air. I mean, why even bother shooting weather footage? Just green screen the guy in front of a weather clip. <laughs> you know, I get it. People have to, you know, you got to get people to tune in. You got to sell ads to pharmaceutical companies. You have to do it, right? <laughs> For whatever reason. And it, it's just, why do you have to lie about it? It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, I like the fact that with the consciousness thing, but let me ask you, like, is, has this been something that's been ongoing for the existence of, um, mankind? The, the, you know, how our consciousness manipulates the, um, the atmosphere essentially. Yeah. Well, I mean, that lake is obviously been going on forever probably, but yeah. As far as people understand, well, I mean, you know, people, uh, rain dance, you know, they have make a rain dance, Native American tribes and things, and they they want to make it rain, stuff like that. Or, Do you think there was something to that? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, I've made it rain. It's not like, it, to me, it's not that big a deal. So I understand the mechanics behind it. Mm-hmm. Now, does it always work? No. But it can work more often than not. Or, or you can clear the skies. You know, you you ever lay down on the grass and try to make clouds do weird things? And, and sometimes it works, mm-hmm. you know, and that because there is a link to our mind and our emotions. No, Wilhelm Reich, did he do, um, didn't he do work with like a cloud buster of some sort? Yes. And what is that exactly? Is it, a, it's a physical device. Um, it's organ based with copper tubes pipes mm-hmm. and, and was would, this a, they, was it a successful um experiment? well yeah there's uh you know he would make it rain in areas that were desert and there was a ufo phenomena around it too really so, yeah so he, apparently ufos would come in when he or they'd remove it when the cloud busters were, were shot at them and um you know eventually you know, Reich was put in jail for this stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and 
the Cloudbuster stuff went underground for a while, and it didn't really. It started popping up in the early '90s again. Now, are you these know? difficult devices to to physically make? No, they're not difficult. Have you ever attempted it? Well, I make them. Yeah. Oh, okay. I sell them. The Cambuster is a cloud. I didn't know you sold them. I you, you have so yeah, many products that it's um. The Chembuster is a, is a form of one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's just a different name. That's okay. Like marketing term. Well, I see the four rods in the Chembuster, um, and those are copper tubes. I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a fascinating thing. Um, I, you know, I do see a picture of one that he has where it almost looks like, like um, six missiles, almost like you know they're very yeah. very long tubes. Um, so, I mean, I'm just assuming, you know, different designs, different, you know, it does, as long uh, as there's a balance there, I'm sure that they, the they process made, you know, works. They made, those, they made those long tubes for that. Why that length? I don't think there was any reason behind it. I see. Um, so I, I went with shorter tubes because I, I didn't really think the tubes really had that much of an impact on the device. Right. You know? So I, I would make, you know, people make alterations to things, you know, they examine, well, this is not actually necessary. So like the base is what generates the power, right? So I focus on making the base as strong as it can. And the tubes are secondary, you know, so the tubes are just like shooting the gun. So has, have these designs ever that you know of been, I guess, industrialized and used by the military? Because these, these are very powerful Used, you know, used in a certain way. These are very powerful. Well, if they have, they do not mention it. Right. I mean, yeah. there's definitely a word out there that you know weather manipulation is constant, like we were just discussing. But do you think even the consciousness is uh, of mankind is, I guess, um, overshadowing even so a device such as a cloudbuster? I mean, the the thing is, is that the Cloudbuster still is going to affect stuff in its buster, own space. The Cloudbuster is an extension of our consciousness. Oh. In other words, to the degree that the thing is effective is to the degree that the person that has it knows how to use it. So, like, linking with the Cloudbuster and projecting with your mind, you can make it work a lot better than someone that just sticks it in the yard and forgets about it. Mm-hmm. You know, because, it, you know, it, it's an alchemical tool or weapon or instrument, whatever you want to call it. Right, right. And then it's like, well, how do you use these things? Are you, are you capable of wielding it correctly? Right. And someone that is, quote, a magician has to know how to project energy. Right. Because otherwise it'll come back at you. No, so, I, I just wanted to mention that... Um... You also do private sessions with people. Um, you, you have yeah. um, another website called um, AscensionEnergyProgram dot com, yes. and you know you can actually reach out to Kevin. And if you you know, there, there's just a number of things that you will work with people on a one to one basis with. And um, yeah, you can learn all about. It. I just wanted to bring that up because I just realized well, I didn't bring it up. I, my flat. Well, I, I I utilize the energy machines for clients basically. So. I basically charge people a monthly fee mm -hmm. and I treat them around the clock with the technology. I see. And everything's done remotely with photographs as a witness, hmm. you know? So rather than, you know, I mean, I, I do talk to people have, have individual sessions, but the majority of the work is via the technologies and the machines and um, as, as a way of building up your own energy levels. And, you know, my philosophy is with most people is I'm not your, your teacher, right? I'm sort of like providing the energy to push you in the direction you want to go. I'm getting you over your obstacles and getting over the way, the things in your way that you can't cut, quite get over the hump. Hmm. It's a lot of, from my point of view, it's a lack of energy. It's not that you don't know what to do. You just don't have the juice to do it. It feels like sometimes I think in general as people – we have almost too much energy and we don't have a way to focus it towards yes. um, a level of organization. Like what's the next step? Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> so you don't take it. 
you know. Growth in life is generated through insights. Synchronicities are, are, t- are types of insights. Mm. And it's the insights that give us power, right? Have so, you always had this kind of far, further understanding of this, even when you were a kid? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you just, just you, there's a certain comfortability you have yeah. with it that you can just tell it's like, this is who you are. You know, it's a, it's a very interesting. Well, you know, what well, at ten years old, my grandmother goes in the hospital, and she dies. Right. So, she comes back to life. A few months later, she dies again. Comes back to life. Okay, the third time, the priests go in, and they're going to give her the last rites for a third time. Oh my God. And they get, and then one guy goes. Are you going to stay dead this time? We've been in here. This is the third time. So she dies again and then comes back to life and then lives another 20 years. Oh, my so, God. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's right. insane. So I got imprinted very young with, you know, well, you just pray and then people come back to life. No big deal, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> pray real but, hard. But that that was kind of the attitude I had with a lot of things. And, you know, so then I kind of live life and I I forgot completely about any of that stuff because that was just an experience that imprinted me. It wasn't like it changed my life at that point in time. Later on, it would change my life. Right. Mm -hmm. But it let it it really let created the, you know, this breakthrough at that point. But I think it I opened up to how to look at the world from a magical point of view. So I was looking for all these anomalies in life rather than the things that were routine. So I did I do think it changed the way I looked at the world. Although I was always really curious, but that was a watershed moment when that happened. That's uh, you know, that's one of those life-changing events I'm thinking for everyone, right, including your grandmother. Right. And I've had a lot of over the years I've had a lot of bizarre synchronicities and spiritual phenomena. So yeah, I'm very comfortable with um, no, also, I also think with synchronicities, it's also, it helps when you're w- talking to somebody who can help you be aware of them because they, they're, yeah. pro- they're happening all the time and right. it's just, you're ignoring them because you're on friggin' Facebook or something, you know, you, sometimes I, I think that the world will just pass you by and you know, all of these yeah. magic, it's like, show me a sign that you're real. And it's like you know, there's a million things going around, but your your head's buried in your iPhone. Yes, um, it's you know it's, it helps probably to have somebody with a mind you know to help you. I'm sorry. Well, that that that's the one positive from the internet is I well you know my clients are all over the world. So the odd thing is, I'm friends with more of my clients than I am with anyone in New York per se because no one in New York even knows what I do real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it, that world does not exist for these people. Mm-hmm. Although there are a few people in New York that would be open to my work, but in general, it's it's all the people on the internet that you know found me through the stories on my blogs or mm-hmm. the information, you know, and, and then sought you're, you and, out basically, right? And then you're entering a whole new world where this crazy stuff can happen, <laughs> you know. Um, one of the things, and this is like going to another thing. This is another. As if, like, your experiences and what you do aren't fascinating enough. Um, Something you've spoken about is neurocranial restructuring, uh, Mm -hmm. which is NCR treatment. And I I heard about this, but I never really did much about it. And I went on YouTube and typed it in, and you have to see these people getting the treatment. And it's amazing stuff. And... um, you, I did you work with kids with Down syndrome, um, who and you know with this treatment? Well, I I was an assistant for Doctor Hal for eight years, mm-hmm. um, and he's the founder of uh, NCR Neurocranial Restructuring. He's a naturopath doctor from Seattle, and you know he's been doing that thirty something years. And have, I I haven't personally worked anyone with Down syndrome. Oh, I mean, okay. Had other types of of um, people with you know mental and emotional issues. Okay. But basically, what NCR does—I mean, you can work with Downs, 
I mean, it's, it's possible, but I, I just personally never, we never had any clients during eight years here. Um, so, the, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, so <laughs> basically is endonasal therapy refined to a, a methodology where it can release, um, connect the, uh, release pressure points in the head and the face with the least amount of force. So we're basically targeting, finding where the body needs to open up as opposed to where the body doesn't want to open up. So they do a, a, some kinesiology to determine which of the six holes in the nose alone. Right? Mm-hmm. So you're seeing connective tissue and basically restoring structure. So the goal is to move your structure into its most ideal position. I mean, it, it really seems very simple. Um, and I would hope that people don't go and try it themselves or something. So I would imagine if you don't know what you're doing, you might actually be messing with something. But it's a, the little balloons that get inserted into each nostril, and they put a certain amount of pressure, like in a, a squeeze bulb, yeah. for, a short, for a very short amount of time. It doesn't look like the um, person, the patient, is um, in pain of any sort, maybe uncomfortable for a second, maybe you get that feeling of drowning for a second, but they, well, they can breathe an, through their mouth. It's an inflation like a balloon. It goes in and then it releases after like two seconds. And it's so. their ear, their eyes tear up clearly because, you know, these are, there's a ton of um, nerve endings right there. That's why we sneeze, <laughs> you know. It um, can. It can release um, sinus problems. And it, it seems helps. like people, you know, their whole face. Uh, in one example I was watching, their face actually changed. Um, not right away or anything like that, but um, over a relatively short amount of time. And in your experiences with this, did you actually, uh, um, you didn't grow three inches, but you allowed your body to actually um, unwind so that you were actually three inches taller? Yeah, it corrected um, a scoliosis. Oh, okay. So as the you know, as the spinal curves started to to open up, three inches is you know, <laughs> three inches yeah. is three inches. I mean, that's pretty yeah. massive. And I've also done dental restructuring work. So they pulled teeth as a kid. They shouldn't have done that. They should have widened my palate and left the teeth in. We know oh, that. That's too. interesting. Yeah, you know, I just went through that with my kid with um, what is it called? The uh, palate expander. Right. You know, and yeah, the doctor, um, the um, orthodontist was um, very adamant about getting, you know, getting it, at, you know, leaving it in there, making sure that it's, you know, as wide can be and all that kind of stuff. Yes. So That's, it's it's for this very reason? Because that, and that'll help with um, cerebral spinal fluid. It, and it re, it's optimizing your mental and emotional state. So like one of the biggest problem with neurological and emotional dysfunction, a lot of it's related to structure. And so if like, if your structure is not anywhere near optimum, then a lot of these problems are simply because the nerve nervous system is impinged, cerebral spinal fluid's not flowing correctly. And this alters or or radically alters our mood and our behavior. Right. And so then if we can release the, the structure and, and unlock it, the nervous system is, is no longer impinged and the, the body's starting to accept the proper nerve impulses and things. And if you look at, I, I like to say the difference between heaven and hell is an angle. So if you correct the angles, you correct your moods, right? It's a, I mean, it's a, it seems really fascinating. It's really new to me. So uh, right. you know, these videos so are kind of really wild. So it's, it's part of like putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, there's a <laughs> physical component to creating, you know, emotional and mental health, right? And so I, I had some structural problems from teeth pulling and head trauma and things like that. Bad diet, you know, I basically grew up on pizza and Coca-Cola. Yeah, before, Long Island, yeah. You know, and all these things had an effect in the development and... I, I sought to unwind that, and but there had to be a physical component because it it wasn't working just with treating the mind or, or the emotions, you know. So like conventional therapy never worked for me at all, and I, I kind mm-hmm. of threw that. 
Yeah, because your mind's there. You know, if you have an issue, you it sounds like you know you're grounded enough to be able to come to certain conclusions on your uh, own. Before, before with poor structure, you it would you just keep looping, mm-hmm. right? You wouldn't get the solutions because your head was not your head's not in the right position. Your brain's twisted. You know, you're not thinking correctly. You know, I find with even um, there are certain foods that I'll eat that completely put me into like my head's buzzing and I can't focus. And um, right. I'm kind of going through that a little bit now because we're going on vacation this weekend. So I don't give two craps what I'm eating, you know? Yeah. And, but very often, you know, uh, I'll eat very, very clean. <laughs> um, I call it clean. And, you know, I find myself not eating clean. And when I don't eat clean and there's too much sugar in my system and that type of stuff, I can't get anything done. I can't focus. I know that if I didn't have this garbage in my system, which will immediately can go out, you know, I'm lucky enough where I could just in two days, it'll pretty much wash itself away. Um, I can get back to this, you know, I can get back to concentration. Right. But um, otherwise I become just, you know, I like today, I just didn't get as much done nearly as what I really wanted to get done. Um. Yeah, sometimes I think that it, it really helps to speak to somebody about that kind of stuff. And, you know, some people have no idea that it's their lifestyle that needs to be changed. And um, sometimes guidance is really helpful. Now, do you still work with NCR treatments, or is this something that you, you learned about and moved on? I get treated by a friend of mine that, that uh, is trained in New York City. I see. So... He, I'll get treatments from him every now and then, mm-hmm. but I, I don't. I never was trained. I didn't really want to go in that direction of becoming a, a practitioner because I, I was a massage therapist, and that was the world I was coming from. And I, I really did not want to be a practitioner that much longer. Right. So, well, you wear many hats. <laughs> right now, just just the internet stuff mostly. Right. But um. Energy, a lot of energy stuff. And, that, you know, I, I refer people in different places, too. You know, so a lot of people come to me and I'll be like, oh, you can go to this guy. Or that. Right. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I really appreciate you taking the time tonight to speak with me, man. It's like you've been a totally fascinating conversation. So many different topics. It's um, like I said, you cover you really you've been there and done so much. Um, I just want to mention your website again, but I will be putting a link to these in the show notes as well as on my website. But. Um, if you go to organproducts.org, you can learn all about the different products that Kevin offers, um, right there from chem busters to, um, to just, uh, a, a no, I mean, you do carry a lot of different stuff, um, different type of organic, um, um, even, oh, I'm sorry, I'm like, I'm like just going down here and it's like a toothpaste with, um, xylitol, which is actually excellent i use um, something like this where it doesn't have the i'm like brain farting right now um what is it in the water the um what's the additive that's not in this toothpaste fluoride fluoride (laughs) you know um here in nasa i don't know if it's this way in suffolk county but there's no fluoride in the water here i'm in manhattan do you have no but i'm saying in um so i don't know if it's all of long island but um Do they have fluoride in Manhattan water? Probably. <laughs> Probably. Um, I know you have a different water source than what Nassau County would get, but um, I know for a fact that Nassau County does not have fluoride. So, um, but you know, you never know. I mean, <laughs> That's why people are smarter over there, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Thank you, sir. That's why we pay the high taxes and, and just kind of, you know, drone on with our work. <laughs> we just make believe we're not spending these prices. So, um, <laughs> Kevin uh, Coutois, I want to thank you so much for spending time here. You can actually reach out to Kevin for a private session at ascensionenergyprogram.com. Again, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. They think if I spelled it out right now, like, I would just, I would mess that up. But um, it's really amazing work that you do, and um, I look forward to, you know, hopefully um, having you on again to talk more about the stuff that you're, you're working on and where this is all going 
I could tell a few stories too. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. And anytime you want to come back on, um, the door is wide Don't mean to cause you trouble, I just